Can I now ask you to give a very warm welcome to my colleague and friend, George Galloway, who's going to speak to us next. George? Yes. Uh, Jeremy, listening to your introduction and my friends, Seamus and Andrew, I honestly didn't know whether to laugh or cry, though cry uh, was the most likely uh, outcome. It is surreal to hear collated in this way everything that we in the anti-war movement predicted 13 years ago, almost to a T. Mr. Blair likes now to say that he has been surprised by the subsequent uh, course of events. But that's just another lie. Because he heard it from millions, even when they didn't know what they know now, that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that the entire thing was a tower of lies. But he heard it face to face, man to man, from me outside the gentleman's lavatory in the library corridor <laughs> of the House of Commons, to be <laughs> precise. I told him that the fall of Baghdad would not be the beginning of the end, but just the end of the beginning. I told him there were no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but if he and Bush invaded, there would be hundreds of thousands of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, that the extremists would descend like spores on the wounds that he and Bush were ready to open. I told them that if you invade and occupy Iraq with hundreds of thousands of Western soldiers in George Bush's crusade, extremism will cascade all over the world. Even, I said, in our own country, more than two years before it did on 7-7-2005. I talked about this Hydra at this point Alastair Campbell, about whom more later, pulled him away because it was threatening to get physical. So it is surreal to me to hear you and Andrew and Seamus adumbrate the theatres of conflict. And I, I won't repeat most of them. But Seamus said that, or you did, Jeremy, welcome to this very secure building. Well, we must hope it is uh, a very secure building. If it is, it is one of the few in this country that can be so described as a very secure building. I want to talk about our prediction that if you make war against Muslims abroad, you will end up at war with Muslims at home. Nothing could be more certain if you pump the air full of hatred of Muslims, Muslim leaders, Muslim countries, rogues, terrorists. Do you expect the tabloid media and other sections of the media, do you expect the right, the racists, to make a distinction between that Muslim over there and the one praying in the mosque on my street or who owns a shop or a restaurant uh, just around the corner from me. What kind of level of consciousness do you imagine exists that if you demonize Islam and its various leaders to the extent that you are doing, you are sowing dragon's teeth and you will reap the whirlwind. And we haven't yet, not since 2005. But I can tell you, it's not a state secret. And if it is, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> that the head of the British Security Services says that an attack in Britain is, and I quote him, virtually inevitable. Now he may not have meant it quite so strongly. He did have a price tag at the end asking for more money and more resources. 
But if it is virtually inevitable, that means it's almost certain to happen. If I told you it's virtually inevitable when you go out there that you're going to be knocked down by a bus, you wouldn't cross the road. So we must assume that he's telling the truth and that some kind of variant of these Paris atrocities is coming our way. Which of course will add yet another twist, yet more hatred, yet more bigotry, yet more recruits for the extremists and the fanatics. So the wars that you are describing and discussing this evening have to include the war at home. It turns out that we have the opposite of what we need. We need smart, better intelligence. But we have fools, it would appear, in charge of our security. I just read The Guardian tonight that GCHQ has been busy hoovering up the emails of the journalists on the BBC, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, The Sun, Reuters, NBC, ABC. Did they think that there might be some jihadists working for The Daily Mail? Is this the use to which they're putting the money and resources that they have? They're spending billions, we don't know how many, because it's a state secret, it's not revealed. But they couldn't keep track of the two fanatic murderers who decapitated Lee Rigby in broad daylight in a South London street. They have, again I hope it's not a state secret, they have for the first time in British history dispersed the SAS across the country, no longer based in one place, Hereford, but dispersed around the country because they believe that this attack, Mumbai style attack when it comes, will take place in what they call the provinces rather than in London. And they need to have SAS soldiers <coughs> by uh, for a quick reaction. So this is a pretty disastrous situation that we face. And it is all, of course I'm not exculpating the actual murderers who should be imprisoned for 99 years, the people who killed Rigby. But that doesn't mean we can avoid telling the truth as I told William Hague in the lift in this very building. I told William Hague these two people who killed that soldier in South London, if they'd gone to Syria instead, you would have paid their airfare. You would have bought them the knives. Our policy of supporting from the 1980s until now, this day, David Cameron's just announced, we are going to be training moderate Islamists in Syria and hoping they don't defect to Al-Qaeda or ISIS as soon as we have trained them like all the weapons we gave which were immediately stolen by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Our policy of building these Frankenstein monsters around the world is proof that they never read the novel Frankenstein to the end. For if they had, they would know that once you've built it, it's out of your control. That's why it's called a monster. Once you've created it, it will do whatever it likes. And that's exactly what has been happening. It's what happened in France. It's what happened in Belgium. And if the security services here are uh, to be believed, it's virtually inevitable that it's going to happen here. One last point before I go to the Grimmond room, Jeremy. Somebody asked me today in an interview, what can we do to stop this radicalization? Should we ban WhatsApp? 
Should we stop these preachers, preachers of hate, in tabloid speak? Should organizations like Hezbollah Tahrir and others be proscribed? I told the interviewer the only thing necessary to radicalize a Muslim in Britain today is the ability to watch the television. Last summer, everybody, including the two million Muslims, watched not just the slaughter of 2,160 Palestinians trapped in the Gaza Strip, 500 of them children, the majority of them women and children, with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Not only did they have to watch that happening, they had to watch our government supporting the murderers. They had to watch our government supporting those carrying out the slaughter, as did the French and Muslims everywhere. Crikey, what is remarkable is that there are so few fanatics, so few extremists, not that there are so many. So Seamus is right, Andrew is right, what is to be done? The opposite of what we're doing. It's not rocket science. We should do nothing else and reverse that which we are doing on the principle that when you're in a hole, stop digging. We should stop supporting the murderers in Gaza and start supporting the victims of the murderers in Gaza. We should stop invading and occupying one Muslim country after another and subverting one Muslim country after another, backing the extremists in Syria, supporting the military junta in Egypt and so on. We should stop it and let the people of those countries decide their own future. Stop propping up these rotten, corrupt dictators who rule the Muslim world, almost without exception, from one end to the other. Saudi Arabia, which was at the front of the march in Paris, by the way. The Saudi ambassador was marching for press freedom and freedom of speech in Paris. In the very week that they were lashing with a whip in public 50 times for the next 20 weeks, someone who wrote a blog criticizing not Islam, not the prophet, criticizing the corrupt appointees in the religious establishment who are merely stooges of the kleptocracy that run Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is our best friend. We are never done trying to sell them more weapons. We are never done trying to send them more trainers. When they invade their neighbor Bahrain, we support it. How seriously can any Muslim take our protestations of being in favor of freedom and liberty, freedom of speech, when our best friend is the dungeon of the region and the unfreest country on the earth? Thank you very much indeed for coming. <laughs>